Thank you, Bill, for those uh, very, very kind words. Uh, just that one little clarification. Uh, let a movement not to abandon the central city. <laughs> not that I'm saying every time a church changes campuses, you're sinning or it's a bad idea. But in our case, there was absolutely no reason to move because we were still surrounded by tons and tons of people. St. Marcus is located on North Avenue, uh, which at one time was the absolute epicenter of Milwaukee's worst slum. In 1967, the riots that tore up Milwaukee had their center of those riots only about three blocks away on King Drive and North Avenue. And it was nothing but a, a disaster for the city, which we have only still, we're still working on overcoming all these years later. It's my privilege to talk to you a little bit today about the concept of a value proposition. Now, most of you are in business. I don't see too many of my fellow clergy guys here, so most of you are, are business type people. What is a value proposition in your business? How, do you know what that word is? Do you know that phrase? How would you describe it? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Something that will bring value, not to you, the owner, but to your customers. In other words, what would attract and keep a customer of your business? Service. Mm -hmm. yep. Go ahead. Keep going. You're telling me some of your value prop. Uh, Go ahead, Robert. I work in Forum, and so uh, the, uh, I guess our, our advantage is uh, service our clients uh, really well. And the fact that we've won a uh, third place for Somebody else would. <laughs> That's good. Robert called it your competitive advantage. Also not a bad term. In fact, I have no problems using that to describe congregational ministry as well because it's, it's just different terminology describing why would anybody want to become a member of your congregation? And the twin concept is like unto it. Why would anybody stay a member of your congregation? In a world of many choices, we are more and more and more a consumer-driven age where people not only want choices, they expect it. They're entitled to choices. And if somebody does not take care of them, they are heartless in moving away and giving their loyalty to a different brand. That's always been true to some point. But the changes in computers, digital technology, and telecommunications, with the, in every six months there is a new product out there clamoring for attention. And you can't say, well, my, my people bought that, my customers bought from me two years ago, and of course they'll buy this. Two years ago in, in the telephone business is like an eternity, isn't it? Just, um, think how fast, just, just it seems like this the day before yesterday, a, a, a cellular phone meant you had a brick, a big black brick on a wire that plugged into the cigarette lighter in your car. And now today, you've basically got something about the size of a deck of cards that can tuck into your pocket, or you can surf the web and do everything on the internet. In fact, studies tell us that most young people, millennials, between the ages of 18 and 30, their smartphone is their computer. They not only have gotten rid of landlines, they're not even so sure they, at home, they want or need a desktop computer anymore, and they do everything off of that little square. I want to talk to you about a value proposition. What I mean by a value proposition is your attractant. What brings people? What's, what pulls people together and keeps them together? In the Lutheran church world, the way in which the American uh, Lutheran experience took place, especially in the Midwest, is that it was 100% based on immigration. Everybody who was German would clump together in a congregation where German was spoken. If you're an immigrant where the dominant language is not your language, you feel taken advantage of, you feel isolated, and you clump together with other people ju just like you. And we did that phenomenally well. The churches. In, in the United States, in the Midwest, because of emigrations from Germany. Germany's political system was in chaos. Germany was, in the middle 1800s, was in its last throes of ending the medieval age and entering the age of democracy. Germany was not a country 
until 1870. And the revolutions and uh, political turmoil as, as the country was starting to go through the birth pains of becoming a country drove a lot of people out because of the instability, the urban dis distress. Germany economically was going through major changes. Their, uh, enti their inheritance rules favored the firstborn at the expense of everybody else. And in an agricultural society, what are you going to do with your 2,000 acre farm? And you got four kids or six kids. Who gets the farm? Or do you divide it up so that uh, if you got six kids um, and you have a 3,000 acre farm, each kid gets 200 acres? Excuse me, it gets 500 acres, sorry. It gets 500 acres. And then that, then what do you do with your 500 acres when you die? Each of your five kids gets 100 acres? After four generations, you end up with everybody having a farm about the size of this room. So the German inheritance laws mandated to keep the estates together that it would always go to the firstborn. That pretty much screws the second, third, and fourth kid, doesn't it? Because they end up working for their brother. Who wants to do that? So a lot of people left because they just couldn't get ahead. There was not social mobility. It was still a monarchy. There was still very strong authoritarian political stamp. People chafed and were restless at that. They couldn't change it, so they left. And uh, Germany also was going through aggressive military rearmament. And the Prussians uh, in the north uh, were famous for their military academies and were drafting every young man between the ages of 18 and 30. And mothers who did not want their boys to end up as cannon fodder in the Prussian army for their wars of conquest decided to leave. And so for all these reasons, starting in the 1840s and then reaching a mighty crescendo in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, Germans poured into the United States. All other, a lot of other countries around the world, too. Argentina, believe it or not, has a big German population. So did Brazil and uh, there's some in Canada and a bunch in Australia, but pr primarily the United States was the destination. And they brought their culture along with them, and they spoke German and established German churches. They had German publishing companies, and especially in Wisconsin, they were actually the dominant culture by numbers, even though politically the business of government and the business of business was done in English. The Germans outnumbered everybody else, and that was both good and bad. It was good in that it enabled a lot of really great congregations to get planted, but it was bad in that the Germans didn't have to learn English very fast because they thought there's enough of us that we can keep our old ways. And the immigration is both the joy and sorrow of Lutheranism, but it, it's an addiction. It's like alcohol. Having a cocktail with some friends on, on your patio in summer is one of the sweetest pleasures I know. Uh, if you come to visit me and it's after, it's going to say after 4 p.m., let's say if it's after 3 p.m., you and I are heading out to the back with a couple of cigars and a bottle of whiskey. And that to me is one of the purest pleasures I know, is talking with people I love um, with, a, with, a, with a drink. But cocktails also become viciously addictive. And if you're not careful and manage it well, it can become an enslaver. And in the same way, immigration powered us up to get big very fast, astonishingly fast. You want to know how astonishing? My congregation was founded in 1875 with 13 families, 13 couples and their kids. They bought an old house, two-story house, must have cleared out the interior partitions, and they had school downstairs, and they had a chapel upstairs where they would have church services once a week. They had a school teacher first, but then when they called a pastor to great rejoicing, they realized they could only afford one called worker. So they fired the teacher and they said, we only need one because he's not doing anything all week. Same problem we have today, right? <laughs> Pastors are pretty much off from Monday to Monday to Saturday. So he, their pastor was the school teacher as well. <laughs> he had a one room schoolhouse uh, downstairs and then he would have church upstairs on Sunday mornings. And that ratty little organization, as pathetic as you can imagine how, how lame and, and amateurish that setup was, by the 1880s, it's only 10 years later, the congregation had grown so much they were baptizing 200 children a year. That's insane. 
I'll bet many of your congregations, if you have 10 in a year, that's a great year for you. A lot of Wells churches don't even hit five because they're, they're all old people. The, our mother church, St. John's on 8th and Fleet, had 300 baptisms a year. That's insane. So no wonder that church had 3,000 members by 1890. They poured in. So immigration was our value prop, and it was a good value prop in those days. The immigrants were vulnerable. They were homesick like crazy for Germany. And giving them a worship experience and catechism instruction in the mother tongue was like catnip. They came and, and stayed because they felt preyed on by the English-speaking Yankees and Irish who, of course, ran all the politics. The Irish always get into politics and always take over the police force. That's pretty much the rules, isn't it? And, and they did that so here in Milwaukee, too. They were, the Irish were disproportionately into politics here in Milwaukee as well in our state. So we grew like crazy, and that's how the Wells went from its ragtag beginning of three pastors and a couple of pastor trainees and one or two lay people formed the Wells in 1850. And by 1890 and 1900, just 50 years later, we had a seminary and colleges and were set up with mergers to our Michigan and Minnesota friends, which were in a federation and which a few years later would become an actual merger. And all told, all those together probably had 200,000 members all over the, Midwest, the upper Midwest. Pretty tightly contained in that three-state area, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, little scatterings in Iowa and Illinois, but basically three states, 200,000 members in only 50 years. That's clipping right along, isn't it? Well, um, the value prop changed, and the wells did not change with it, at least didn't change willingly with it. World War I came, Germany is the enemy. Now good Americans have to hate the Hun, have to hate the Jerry's. And posters of the Kaiser and those helmets with the iron spikes, uh, with their bayonets uh, stomping and tromping on women and children, stirred young American men to, to sign up in record numbers. Millions of doughboys signed up, and about a million and a half of them, I think, actually went overseas. We fought to kill Germans in World War I. So that suddenly, by strange coincidence, English worship services and Sunday schools began to sprout in 1914. What a coincidence. World War II were the enemy again. World War II hastened the death of what was already a trend, the dying out of German worship services. And after, by 1945, there were only a couple of dozen of them left. But yet still enough that our seminary was still, like, like West Point, you always fight the last war. You train your officers of how to fight the last war. Isn't that true? And, and every military commander knows when you'll go into battle, it's not your first battle plan that is the one that will prevail. It's your second or maybe your third plan because what you expected and what you trained for is not what happens in reality. And my father graduated from our seminary in 1948. It was still standard procedure that every seminarian was trained and expected to deliver a German language sermon, even though in 10 years they were almost all gone. St. Marcus gave up its last German service in the late 1950s. Because um, it, it was simply um, pampering the older remnants of an old generation. It, it was not useful anymore for reaching new people. Here's another business law, and you can say, I don't like business talk in the church, and I'm saying, oh, then you're kidding yourself, because they're simply the laws of human behavior, whether in business or church, and that is when attrition and your competition is gnawing on your customer base at one end, and it, they always will. Your customers die, they move away, they lose interest in your product, or your product no longer is useful to them, and they're changing patterns of life or your competitors steal them, as you hope to steal business from your competitors. They're after you, and they're always gnawing away at your customer base. You have to shovel in more at the front end to make up for what you're hemorrhaging at the back end. Isn't that so? Does, is, that, is that not your world? Is that not the church's world, too, if you want an organization around for your grandchildren to be members of? We act like the laws of gravity have been suspended because we're the church. The fact is, the Wells closed three churches in Milwaukee last year. 
and it kills me to see it. Every one to me is a bitter loss of a platform. And I know they were small and tiny and had, didn't have much strength, but every one of those pieces of geography was a platform for gospel ministry in a neighborhood, and who knows what is going to take its place. It almost certainly will not be the core teachings of God's Word that I absolutely believe are the best shot that people have at experiencing God's grace. The proclamation of God's unconditional love through word and sacrament is our great Lutheran insight and treasure. And there might be other Christian groups in there, but there, it is not going to be as healthy a food. There's poison going to be mixed in with the food if it, if it hopefully it does continue to serve as a church. So I don't just say, well, um, some other Christian group will be there. Like, it's fine. Or all of our people moved away. That one really, if you want to get me all upset and get my sarcasm going, use that phrase, our people. I used to hear that a lot when I was at our seminary, our people, by which my wonderful professors met, whose parish experience, you know, was back in the 30s. So I was trained by older people who were remembering their younger years in the ministry. So it's like I'm screwed in two generations. I'm not prepared for the present, but I'm being trained by people from the past who remember an even farther back past. And they would talk about our people as though that's, that value proposition was going to be sustainable forever. And it isn't. It's over. I want to tell you to get over it. And dreaming that big families are going to, we're going to generate growth in our congregations and send it through big families. Get over that too. It isn't, it isn't going to happen. My great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather had 12 kids. My great-grandfather had eight. My dad had five. I was, I'm the oldest of five. My wife and I had four, and the game has so changed today that there were gasps when she announced her third pregnancy. After the fourth, they took up a free will offering after church uh, to send me to the vet. <laughs> and three or four women separately came up to Carol after church and said, did he knock you up again? Like, why do you let him do that to you? And I, they weren't really sort of kidding. There was some poking in that too, like, what are you, a breeder? Like, what's with this four kids? That's insane. Don't you have a life? Why would you want to be a slave to, those, to the diaper? Why would you want to go back into diaper world all over again? We are losing our, our dream and fondness for and imagination for large families. Now, another day, we can argue whether that's good or bad or, or irrelevant. But that's, those are the behaviors of the people your and my congregations are serving now. Families are smaller. Now, whether you like it or not or agree with it is irrelevant, really. The point is, people groups need a certain birth rate to be stable and sustainable. And that average, uh, if you just do it on pure demographics, I don't care what circle you draw against what demographic, all Polish-speaking people, all Latinos, all women, uh, whatever group you put your circle around, um, middle income earners, whatever it is, if, if that group does not have a reproduction rate of 2.1 per woman of childbearing age, your group is going to shrink. I don't care what it is, it's going to shrink. And we will shrink too. And we are shrinking. The Wells is shrinking. Uh, our congregations are shrinking. About a third are growing, a third are plateaued, and a third are in decline, are in um, serious possibly irreversible decline. I, b I believe anything's reversible, but you must intervene to reverse it. It won't happen by itself. One of the most painful conversations I ever had was with a dear old pastor whose congregation died underneath him. It was called Parkside Lutheran. It was located on Sherman and North Avenue. I don't know if you ever get to Milwaukee very much, but Sherman and North has to be one of the most heavily traveled intersections in the entire state of Wisconsin. It's just north of Washington Park, this beautiful, beautiful, massive park in central Milwaukee. North Avenue carries heavy traffic. Sherman Boulevard is the north and south spine of the north side. Huge traffic, very close to a freeway ramp, so essentially anywhere in the county, and you could be at Parkside in 15 minutes. Extremely accessible. It died in 1982. And the old guy said to me at a pastor's meeting, he would still come a little while, uh, even after he retired, he'd hang out with us a little bit. And he looked at me and he said, Mark, nobody transferred in anymore. 
I want you to think about that. Nobody transferred in. See, he thought the value proposition is my members, as they do better or move out, I transfer them out to the suburbs, but the, then the churches east of me who are throwing off transfers, they will come to me. So transfers in and out. Like he still thought this is a closed sum, a German game where there's some movement. I send some out, but I, I will get more. Like headquarters will send me some more from the inner city church, inner, inner, inner city churches that are doing worse and they will come to me. And that idea sustained him long enough to become convinced of it until it didn't. And the church went out of business. Today there's a Baptist church in that building. I'm glad for the Baptist church. I'm sad that it isn't well. And it didn't have to be so. But here's the gig. We're out of Germans. And this is a big deal. We're pretty addicted to it. How many of you in the room today do not have German or Norwegian ancestry? Be on, don't be ashamed. Raise your hand higher than that. We like having you here. You're a guest of honor. One, two, three, three. What does that tell you? Was there a conspiracy to exclude people like you, John? No. But when you have your worship services only in German, who else would show up? That, that's a big wall. That's like a country club sign. You know, I love playing golf at my friends who have country club memberships. I will never be able to afford that lifestyle, but I sure do love it when they invite me along. And about twice or three times a summer, I get to play at a club. But you know what it says right at the gates? Members only. Talk to the hand. Back off pencil neck. This is not for you. And that's what a German language congregation would say to the rest of the Milwaukee community. This is an insider group. Go away. This isn't for you. We don't, we're, not interest, we're not here to meet your needs. Our value proposition is for immigrants only. The immigrants are gone and the big family era is over. Unless you have a plan C, your organization will go out of business. And if that bothers you half as much as it bothers me, we need to talk about what to do. And it was elegantly summed up by my friend Judy Schultz, who runs a ministry called Lutheran Special Schools. Judy said, Mark, I call that ministry to people not like us. Now, in her case, she has built a thriving ministry serving people with mental and physical disabilities to bring education services to them and use, say, simplified catechisms and engage them and train volunteers of how to serve people like that. That is an awesome thing, and she has plenty of work. I put out to you uh, Mark's hypotheses, or I'd like to call them laws, but that sounds legalistic, doesn't it? I'm going to call them hypotheses or, or uh, maxims or axioms. Here's Mark's rule or Mark's uh, suggestion number one. If you choose in your ministries to minister to people not like you, you will have all the work you can handle. Maybe you choose, like Dave Knack, to do a prison ministry. What started out for Dave Knack and the Wells Prison Ministry to be basically pen pals with a few dozen prisoners turned out to a direct mail enterprise that regularly corresponds with 50,000 inmates all over America. Isn't that incredible? Why did this happen? Because he threw himself into a ministry to people not like you. In this case, people who were not at liberty. They were offenders behind bars. But he chose to give them worth by taking them seriously and their needs seriously and by ministering to them. Judy Schultz's people not like you as people with disabilities. At St. Marcus, I knew that if we don't change, we're going to die. And when I started, I could see it happening. My church had been dying for 60 years and we had probably one generation left. Our school had 56 kids. The principal told me, I don't know how much longer we can keep it open. Two weeks before I was ordained, one of our teachers was laid off and we went from a faculty of four and a half to one of three and a half. We had a congregation of a little over 300 members, 45 of whom were shut-ins. 45 shut-ins. Do you have any sense of the demographics of that group? I spent two weeks out of every month doing nothing but visiting shut-ins over four counties. I had no time for strategic planning or fundraising. I was too busy visiting Shuddin. The average age of the congregation was 70. They had good hearts. They were ready to go, but nobody knew what to do. 
I could tell that they didn't want to die. They were very proud of their tradition. They were willing to change, but change into what? We had to figure this out. But, I, but that was our greatest asset, our beat-up neighborhood and our, that sense of desperation in our older members were powerful assets. You know why? Yes, A, they're motivated and ready, and B, what have we got to lose? The answer is nothing. If we fail and go out of business, we're going out of business anyway. Is, are you okay with that? Some people, some people in our Lutheran tribe are okay with going out of business. As long as you do it with dignity, with your traditions intact and your head held high, you get your gold watch and you salute, and as the ship goes down, we all salute and say, that's too bad. And then we look away because it's embarrassing to see it. But there are now, do you know how many churches of all denominations, uh, LCA, ALC, Missouri, and Wells, have gone out of business in Milwaukee since, let's say, World War II? Just Milwaukee. Just the city limits. I'm not even counting the, the outer ring. Just within the city limits. How many, take, have a number in your head. Pick a number. Since World War II, pick a, pick a number. I want you all of you to have your own private number and be honest. How many of you guessed a number between zero and five? That church has died. Okay, good. You know, I'm setting you up so you're gonna, not going to guess low. All right, good. Getting your attention. How about five to ten? Be honest. I want to know. Okay, you're, 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 you knew I'm setting you up. Okay, how about ten to fifteen? Okay. That's good. About now we get the first our first bites, first nibbles here. About eight of you. Uh, how about fifteen to twenty? Whose number was in that range? Okay, a couple more. How about twenty to twenty-five? Okay, now we're getting a few more realists. How about twenty-five to thirty? Still not enough. The actual number is thirty-three. 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 And not a one of them was necessary. They died because they could not change a value proposition from an immigrant value prop to something else. And I'm putting out to you that this dilemma confronts our entire synod, confronts the Missouri Synod and the ELCA, all the Lutherans in America, in fact, all the old ethnic groups. Catholics have that same dilemma, but I, that's their problem to worry about. I'm concerned about the Lutherans right now. We're talking amongst ourselves. We've got to figure out a new value prop. And that means connecting with people not like you. How do you do that? I'm here to tell you, I'm not here to brag, but I'm t here to tell you that it's possible. St. Marcus, which had an average age of 70 in 1980, probably today has an average age of 30. We had a little over 300 members in 1980. Today it's a little over 1,100. Our school, which was maybe one or two years from closing with 56 kids, today is the largest elementary school in all of Lutheranism in the United States. We have 840 kids. We've done three massive building projects and bought a campus as a fourth project and have 840 children. When we find the right space, either to buy or build, we're going to expand again. We have a waiting list of 200. And what we have found is for us, a value proposition for us is Lutherans, Besides having a Germanic past and formerly having large families, we're great educators. And so for us, maybe not everywhere, but for us, education is a screaming, crying, aching need because most urban school districts are terrible, partly because family solidity, family stability in urban neighborhoods is terrible. I'm not just blaming it all on public school teachers, but they are inflexible. The work rules the layer of union cost and governance and interference, the lack of flexibility, the politicization of governance, and the totally bollocked up way of trying to elect representation. You've got basically nine people managing a billion dollar business who are elected every several years by only 10% or fewer of the Milwaukee electorate who don't know these people and they're, they're running a business that does a, a billion dollars worth of business. Is there any normal for-profit business in the world that would risk its governance with such so chaotic a way? The philosophy is usually, there's nine people on this board, it's usually five to four votes. One election changes it, and the entire philosophy of management can change on a dime in one election season to the next. 
Would you want your business run in such a haphazard way? I don't think so. And Milwaukee's dilemma is, so, is similar all over the nation. Chicago actually had the brains, I think, to simply depoliticize it, or at least reduce its politicization. And it is now, part, it is now um, under the authority of the mayor. So they, there at least is one guy to hold accountable, and you get decisions made at least cons more consistently with the rest of the city's administration. But we have found that people who are not traditionally Lutherans or German or even Christian are really attracted to a, a decent uh, education available to the community. And we want it to be available to all of our, the kids in our school, uh, in our congregation. It is a congregational school, but as long as we have room and as long as we can afford it, we open it up to the community as well. And we were early and enthusiastic uh, adopters of a most unusual opportunity that came along, the Milwaukee Parental School Choice vouchers, which uh, were first opened up in 1990 and then were opened up to religious schools in 1996, went into litigation immediately two years later, took two years to work its way through the system. The Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled it was not unconstitutional in 1998. And St. Marcus was the only school for two years that actually took a chance to see if we could cooperate with the government. Here's an example of flexibility and developing a new value prop. Most of the Lutherans in Milwaukee were terrified by the idea of working with the government, with risking dependence on a tax-based revenue stream rather than offerings or tuition charged to parents. Our, neighbor, our neighbors are so poor, they can't afford the tuition anywhere near what it costs to educate a kid. It, honestly, really, even, even 10 or 15 years ago, it costs at least $5,000 to educate a kid. The tuition we could charge was maybe 500 a year, and even that, a lot of it was uncollectible. So we took a chance on a different revenue stream. And it might have failed, but I, my way of looking at it is, how will we know till we try? Second, what if it works? Third, if we totally hate it and it sucks, then we get out. But in the meantime, we have the quarter of a million dollars. Because that's, even with a modest increase in our student body, the, the parental school choice vouchers brought in a quarter of a million dollars to juice our school with, which had been chronically underfunded and running on fumes for years. Another thing is, I, I believe it was part of my job as the pastor to help people strive for God's biblical view of peoples, people groups. One of the best features of a tribe like the Germans is you get this internal glue right away. When Donald McGavran did his mission work in India and wrote about it, he's the pioneer of missiology, the science of how to plant and grow missions. He championed what he called the homogeneous unit principle or a horizontal principle. He picked one of the castes in India and he did not try to set up a vertically integrated congregation. Are you tracking this? Do you know what I mean? Kind of not. This is a little odd kind of sociology talk in the middle of a, a bunch of Lutherans. But he said, I got to pick my social level and then build it out sideways with other people just like them and get established. The vertical, you, you swing the axis up when you're stable enough that you can start reaching out to the people groups on either side of you because India has an extremely stratified society uh, with the Brahmins on the top and the untouchables on the bottom. So we call that the homogeneous unit principle. That's essentially how the wells got started. But now we need to flip that axis up and reach out to people not like us. So I looked for every way I could to have a three-step process for my members. And I suggest to you that you do a little mental assessment how your church is doing on these three things. First is toleration. And a few of you guys are as old as me, and some are even older. In my youth, my childhood, Hank Aaron, one of my heroes, was not allowed to stay at some of the hotels the white Milwaukee Braves were allowed to stay at. There's still, in my childhood, any restaurant in Milwaukee could refuse service to any black person they wanted. And nothing could be done and nothing was said. It was simply one of the ugly, painful rules of existence. 
And there was apartheid, not just in the South, but there was a under the radar Jim Crow in the North as well. And we all need to learn tolerance. I don't have any rights. My tribe has no rights. My tribe isn't any better than your tribe. Your tribe deserves to be here. But we can do better as Christians. Step two is love. That you really learn to give value to other people. That you love them as God loves us unconditionally. In fact, the more different they are from you, the more important that love is. Maybe for Dave Knack, it meant loving prisoners enough to burn up a, a lot of his life and energy in corresponding with these um, stick-up artists, burglars, rapists, and murderers. But he gave them value by setting up scriptural Bible studies in correspondence with them <clears throat> and recruited hundreds and hundreds of pen pals to give him encouragement and make them feel like they still were human beings um, and that God loved them. Or people like uh, Judy Schultz, who was working with people so disabled they will never be able to hold a real job. And yet she gave them value by reaching out to them and learned not just to tolerate disabled people. You know, sometimes disabled people make noise in church. Sometimes they have a little trouble holding down their excitement if something really gets them going. And if they get looked at, if they get the look, do you know the, women know the look, do you know the look? Have you ever had a, like your child or grandchild on your, on your lap who started squawking and people turn around? Here it is, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate the look for you. If you get the look, that may be your last visit to your organization. People know their kid is squawking. Why don't you go help them? Can I take your, can I take your kid for you? I, I would like you to hear the message. We have a little area right over here. Can I help you? Can I show you where it is? Um, offer to help them instead of giving them the look. So tolerance, love. The third step is, I think, maybe the most important, and that's appreciation. And so what I try to do is to teach my congregation how to bust out of our cultural heritage. And while I love the German contributions to Christian music, I am a J.S. Bach total fan and I love his stuff and yet I, I learned how to play gospel piano because so many black folks lived in our neighborhood and even though I did not need any other styles of music for me personally it is more important for me to shift the musical offerings of our worship services I'm safe I'm good but these people out here aren't so I'd like to broadcast good news of Jesus in their heart language, in a way that makes sense to them. Because our style of music sounds as strange to their ears as some gospel, modern urban gospel groups wailing away sounds strange to your ears. And so, little by little, I figure one of my jobs as, as the executive leader of this outfit is to make you, I'm going to pretend you're my members, make you uncomfortable 10% of the time. You have to be in a constant state of change which initially irritates you because you, you would say to me, why do you make me uncomfortable? Your job is to make me comfortable. And I'm saying, think about your business life. If you are not changing in your business, tweaking your literature, working on your website, bringing in new product lines, going to different conferences, learning new things, trying some stuff, opening up a branch, setting up a second or third or tenth location, if you are not changing your business you have begun to go out of business I don't I just don't know if that law ever has any exceptions when I was a kid and I went shopping at Kohl's what did I buy food if I go to Kohl's today what am I buying clothes that whole organization pivoted around because they were losing their value prop in the food business, which had very tight margins, and they said, we're getting killed. We think we're good at it, we're proud of our food, but we're getting killed. They pivoted their entire organization and entered the department store business and do very, very well. They're, nation, they're a nationwide chain now. You've probably seen Kohl's. If you travel even half as much as I do, you see them all over the country. That kind of mental flexibility is what our congregations need. So we, uh, black music became part of our flavor at St. Marcus. And I learned, I don't, I don't have any gospel CDs. I've never bought a one because it's not my personal music of choice. 
But I learned how to play gospel piano, and I learned the songs, and we got somebody who knew how to do it, who, to organize people. And for some people, it really, they love hearing black music because it shows respect. If you're a black person and you hear black music, it shows respect that we're, we're not just your dependents or servants. We're on the eyes on a level. You're not looking down at me. I'm contributing something to You're giving something to me, but we're making a contribution too. Twice a year, we have worship themes and special Sundays that concentrate on things that are big issues in America. One of them is Martin Luther King's birthday. If it was widely known that St. Marcus has a liturgical Sunday commemorating the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King, some of my pastoral brethren would like to string me up and publicly execute me to snuff out that disease before it infects anybody else in the wells. But let me also tell you it gives me an annual opportunity, and it's by far our biggest and most heavily attended worship service all winter. It gives me an opportunity to talk about racial reconciliation, which is an unfinished piece of business in America. Celebrate not the negative legacy of Dr. King. He was a big fool and sinner just like you, but he articulated two powerful concepts better than anybody and deserves his, uh, and getting shot, of course, kind of um, cements his his uh, martyrhood and his place in the pantheon. But he, better than anybody, articulated two things that the Christian church, dog on better well, stand for. And one is the worth of every human being, the equal worth and dignity of everybody. And white folks have often done that very poorly. And that ain't over yet. We still need to work on that. Second, Dr. King articulated better than anybody, equaled by some, but excelled by no one, in articulating and putting his life on the line for the idea of nonviolent resolution of conflict. And uh, today, idiots with guns are still trying to use violence and threats of violence to get what they want and to solve conflicts with shooting. Uh, our school uh, superintendent last night got the news that his former foster son had been shot three times in a drive-by and is alive only by the pure grace of God. Three slugs in his body cavity, missing key arteries and missing his pump. He's alive, uh, but not because, of, not because of the type of people he was hanging out with. We also decided to uh, reach out to the people in the UK. Every uh, Sunday nearest March 17th, we have a Celtic band that plays Irish music. And then we, we had so much fun with that, we do it a second time. Irish Fest in Milwaukee is always the third week of August, so we have the, the, I call it the Lutheran Cayley Orchestra. Ten minutes? Okay, thank you. Uh, we do uh, Celtic and Irish music. And if you go looking for it, there is a fabulous tradition of Irish prayers, Irish songs, and uh, Irish tunes. Our, we don't know about them so much as Germans because we're so insanely proud of our own Germanic heritage. Uh, we just don't get around enough. But there, we have by now been working at it and have gathered a big bushel basket of Celtic tunes. And the, I tell you what, Irish people love to dance and their songs make you want to jump for joy and just get up and do a jig. And uh, so we really work on that. We also have a country band called the Soggy Bottom Boys. And there's a lot of country music listeners, even up here in Wisconsin. In fact, there's now two country stations on in Milwaukee. And so we do like bluegrass gospel songs. There are great songs from the American South, beautiful expressions of the gospel that present the word in a little different way with a little different vibe. And just throw that in there and you may say, boy, I hated that. Well, okay, next week it'll be something different. So you can hate it a little bit, but it'll be something else. So we keep changing every week. It's something different. Uh, every first Sunday of May is our annual Cinco de Mayo Sunday. Even though we don't have a big Hispanic population on Milwaukee's north side, uh, the big population of primarily Mexicans is on our south side. And probably four or five of the Wells churches on the south side are hip deep in Hispanic ministry. But we do have, I do it for two reasons. We have a Puerto Rican neighborhood uh, along Holton Street in Milwaukee that there still is a Latino presence. But I also do it because immigration is such a sore, hot topic. And even if you... Even if our church doesn't have a lot of Mexicans or Hispanics living heavily around us, 
every one, I want every one of my members to get over their anti-Hispanic bias. This is not the same thing as talking about immigration policy. The politics of the spigot of immigration, how tight do you crunch it down, how do you open it up, is an unsolvable problem in my opinion. There's only politics and some, in some eras, in some decades, there will be efforts to scrunch down immigration and then the pendulum will swing. America's history has been one of constant pendulum swings. Wide open, anybody can come in who wants. Emma Lazarus on the Statue of Liberty, you know, give me your huddled masses. That's America's promise. But then there was a backlash in the 20s and they cranked it down and slammed the door shut for a while. Then in the 60s, it started opening up again. Um, there is frankly, if you want to do something to, to reduce the flow of Hispanic immigrants in America, is this still working? I think I'm out of power. Hello. Well, maybe, maybe it's working or not. I'll just try to talk a little louder. We're almost done. Five minutes to go. If you really want to do something to reduce Hispanic immigration, which is maybe or maybe not even a good idea, do something to help Mexico's economy, and then the people won't have to leave. They're fleeing because they're desperate. You would too. In fact, if you're German like me, you did, or your, your ancestors did. Carl Jeske, my great-great-grandfather, came to America not because he loved America so much, it's because he was so miserable in Germany. He had to leave. He saw no economic prospects and he wanted a fresh start. That's all they're doing. And so we sing uh, bilingual songs. I make people learn a little Spanish and then I make them say the Lord's Prayer in Spanish. And we, get it. we have a mariachi band. There. It's called Los Lobos Luteranos, the, the Lutheran wolves. <laughs> and we have trumpets and, and the guitars and uh, two fiddles. And I'll tell you something, mariachi music gets your blood boiling. And here's another shocker you didn't know. There is a lot of really cool Christian music with a Hispanic flavor, bilingual English and English-Spanish and Spanish stuff that you can find. The Catholics, of course, are ahead of us on that because so many Hispanics are Catholic. These are just some examples. We also do an ethnic potluck dinner every year. Our church anniversary dinner is called an ethnic potluck and everybody's invited to bring some food reflective of your culture and ancestry. So you'll see the Germans will be bringing their sauerkraut and the sausages and sauerbraten and stuff like that. The black folks will be bringing their neck bones and crowder peas and greens. And people love, and the cornbread, people love eating each other's food. And it's a great way not only to tolerate, not only to love, but to come to the third level of cultural engagement, which I call appreciation. And let your imagination go crazy. My last word of encouragement to you is, most of you are not pastors, so you feel pretty powerless in making these changes. Don't feel powerless. Remember, whose church is it? God's first. Yes, Douglas got it. It's my church. It's our church. It's not the pastor's church. Even though he's a shepherd, he's just a sheep up on his hind legs. We're just like you. We have, we're trained for different jobs, but it's your church. So here's one bit of encouragement to you to cultivate an entrepreneurial style in your congregation where you're not afraid to take risks and try things. Let me invite a word of compassion for your pastors. If you see something really cool and you and your wife talk about it on the way home and you're smiling, that was kind of cool, I like that. Or, yeah, maybe that wasn't my cup of tea, but I was, see, I was looking at the faces of the people around me and they were totally into it. I'm glad Pastor did that or allowed it. But two people who hated it chewed his butt for five minutes after church. What do you think is going to be on his mind? He never heard from you, but the two guys who yelled at him, especially if they were major donors, means he's never going to stick his neck out like that again. You are needed to clap and cheer for innovation in your ministries, to give courage to people who, especially insecure pastors, we're so insecure, we so need your approval, and we're so hungry to be liked and loved. One or two negative people make us stop innovation because we don't want to offend anybody. A church that's too terrified to offend anybody so they never do anything 
has begun to choke itself. It has begun a self-asphyxiation. And I'm sad to say, will die. It gives me no pleasure to say that. So instead of that, encourage risk-taking, even if it fails, even if you didn't like it. But at least you're putting it out there and then have some metrics to see, did this work? Or do we want to just add this as part of the mix, part of the buffet? As St. Paul said, so that I might by all means, he said, I'm going to be all things to all people. I w I'm going to have mariachi music and gospel music and Irish Celtic music and cowboy songs, cowboy gospel, bluegrass gospel, and chorales. Don't push them out. And chorales and pipe organ and guitars and piano so that I might by all means win some. The end. Thank you for inviting me today.